everyone, I'm Daniel Tomaromi, Head of Research at Tusk Security Labs, and with my colleague Laurent, we'll be talking about pointing to away baseband. This presentation will be divided into three chapters, and with each, we'll try to highlight a takeaway that answers one of these questions. First, that mobile phones are more than containers for running App Store apps, and they should be threat modeled for accordingly. Second, that bug hunting is very rarely a straight line from start to finish. And the third takeaway for us is that low-level security can be about a lot more than auditing code of uh, typical parsers that just happen to be running in a different execution context. So to start, let's talk about why we picked Huawei Kirin at our, as our research target. And the answer to that question is essentially in the name. Kirin meaning unicorn, so a friendly, fluffy little target. At least that's what we thought in the beginning, but more on that later. So why did we think that? Well, first of all, Huawei Baseband has been researched before. Uh, a source code leak publicly exists uh, for a long time. And of course, the Android side is known uh, for it can be rooted and it's pretty debug friendly. For instance, uh, the modem crash logs are accessible without root. And it was also uh, shown in previous research that the memory isolation wasn't complete. So for example, the Android side can straight see the uh, memory of the modem. That's where we started. So we thought this would be a good target, but of course we wanted to pick something in the baseband which uh, would be novel in a way. So our definition of a good target there was that it should be a part of the 3GPP stack implementation that is not in the leak and something that would be different than prior baseband zero days that have been published, which for the most part are all in the area of NAS and information elements where the TLV parsing in, it, it, itself has the straightforward bug of the length is not checked. And the third aspect here for us was that one thing about Huawei Baseband hardening that was known is that everywhere instead of memcopy, they use a safe variant, which actually, check, uh, which actually catches out these typical uh, TLV based overflows. And the answer for the target finding for us lied in the difference between the NAS and the AS layer in 3GPP. So what are these? NAS is the non-access stratum. What that means is that it's uh, the part that is actually a logical link between entities where one endpoint is the mobile phone, but the other endpoint is an entity inside the operator's network. And the functionality here are the things that you would first think of as what the baseband does. It manages the mobility, the connectivity, like calls and texts, and the data sessions as well. In contrast, the access stratum is basically the final link. It's the actual wireless uh, 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 link between the cell tower and the mobile phone. And accordingly, the protocol, uh, the protocol that is part of uh, access stratum has uh, uh, the, the responsibility of dealing with the, the management of the radio link, the radio channels themselves. And as it turns out, RRM, the radio resource management uh, layer, was uh, exactly the target that we were looking for, both because it's a pretty complex implementation, even though it's for GSM, it had a lot of 3G and 4G revisions later, and also because it actually uses a form of uh, bit-based encoding, which is different from your typical information element TLVs. So how does that work exactly? And this is where we get introduced to CSN1 or concrete synth syntax notation. Well, I'm sure you would have heard about ASN1 and CSN is very similar. The difference is essentially in that first letter. Whereas in ASN1, you have abstract object types like sequences, enumerations, integers, and that allows that syntax uh, to, to use that grammar for all kinds of different protocols. In CSN1, you don't have these kind of abstract types at all. You only have bit conditionals and bit length fields. And from there, everything in the definition ties the grammar syntax and the particular protocol, uh, protocol together. If you're interested in the, all the details, then these are the specification numbers that you can look at. If you want to read thousands of pages, uh, I would hope that you'll be encouraged to do so after our presentation. So what is uh, interesting for us in a concrete syntax notation? Uh, well, it's that it's not actually that concrete, even though it seems straightforward, not everything is fixed. There are still, like in ASN1, variable length elements, which can be explicit and implicit. Explicit, not so interesting for our presentation. We're going to focus on the implicit form, which comes in this uh, syntax that you see on the slide with this star star one notation. And what that means is that when the decoder encounters the fields like this, then what it does is when you see a one bit, that means that there's one more repetition of the field and you keep going with new repetitions that you have to parse out as long as you don't get a, a zero bit. 
This also exists in the other format in the specification, of course, where the rows of the bits are flipped. So the question obviously that follows is where, where are in the syntax the length constraints for these kind of repetitions? And the answer, unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on how you're looking at it, is uh, nowhere. Unlike information element TLDs and unlike the ASN1 syntax, constraints are just not part of the grammar. If you dig enough into the specification, then in some cases, we highlight one on the slide, you can find written text that says, oh, by the way, and you should have not more than 96 repetitions, let's say. But by and large, even this is not there. And so that's, case, that's basically going to be our bot class, unbound recursive repetitions. And you can see that this is a very interesting uh, uh, proposition that the specification itself doesn't say anything about constraints. That means that if you would have an implementation that followed the specification perfectly, you would, it would still not have constraints. In other words, it's left up to the implementer to decide. And that is typically a good news for the bug hunter. So then it's time to fire up your Gidra and start looking at how Huawei actually implements CSN1. Turns out the implementation was fairly complicated, uh, but long story short, it's a two-stage two process. And the first one is a stack-based virtual machine. And here, of course, we had to spend a bunch of time understanding the binary uh, uh, compact format of the opcode uh, uh, definitions for the various little VM programs that represent the decoding of certain messages and also understand the role of the VM. But finally, we figured out after writing our own decompiler, you can see an example of the output on the screen, that long story short, the VM doesn't do any unserialization per se. There's no copying yet. It only tags the message to identify the fields that are present. And then there's a second stage, and that's actually regular code, so it's easier to comprehend. And that's the one that does the copying. And it's important to point out that the copying itself will always happen into a fixed sized uh, union that contains uh, the unserialized version of uh, each message. So your question is going to be, well, where are the validity checks? From the decompilation phase, we were able to conclude that it's not in the VM. So that follows that it should be in the unserialization code. But as it turned out, it also was not there. It was basically not anywhere. So at this point, we have instances of the actual bug class. In fact, every single bound unbound repetition in this code is basically a bug. So great for us, we have you know, a lots of bugs. Except, of course, bugs are not the same thing as exploitable vulnerability primitives. And we found that out through a lot of blood, sweat and tears, and that was uh, all uh, Laurent's work, until we finally were able to find some that actually worked as good vulnerabilities. Well, before I go into a detail of uh, describing one, let's talk about drawbacks and advantages of this uh, bug class that we have defined here. One drawback is the bit encoding itself. When you think about it, this will mean that in many cases you will, in the grammar, for example, take three bits and decode that into a byte, or take seven bits, decode that into a byte. And what that's going to mean, of course, is that in the output, even if you do everything right for your perspective and you can corrupt, for example, a pointer, you might not be able to create all the values that you want for that pointer. The other constraint was uh, the size of the inputs. Lots of these RRM messages, the system information messages in particular, are very short, 21 or 23 bytes typically. So that naturally limits the number of repetitions you can cram inside. And then finally, on the flip side, there's the output location and size. As I mentioned, uh, the whole thing goes into one fixed union, which is actually on the BSS for most cases, uh, which is not as good because already you don't get a direct stack or heap buffer overflow primitive, even if you can go outside that union. And secondly, because it's one union for all the messages, it's actually very large in size. So in practice, a lot of these unbound repetitions lead to overflows where you basically just run out of bits and you don't actually get to corrupt anything. On the flip side, there are many advantages though. Uh, the biggest ones is that because these repetitions show up in a lot of nested structures, so it's a structure inside a structure inside a structure, what we get is that uh, in many cases with a single extra input bit, we can actually create a large increment in where we're writing in the output. So that can create scenarios where even with few inputs, we actually manage to corrupt far enough. And the second part was the huge variance. Uh, in the end, even if we only count the cases that we could turn into meaningful corruptions, we ended up with several hundreds of cases. And if you would look at every bug instance, I mean, you could use the lame joke that the entire specification was a bug. <laughs> 
But of course, somebody had to go and find a particular vulnerability that works and Laura and put in uh, all that work. Uh, and long story short, we actually ended up with a couple of pretty good ones. You can see like an out of bound ripe, stack buffer overflow or heap buffer overflow. So in the interest of time, I'm only gonna describe one of them in detail, but in the white paper that we have also published with this presentation, you can see the details for all the other ones. So here we're gonna go middle out. So we're gonna start from where finally the bug hits and then work our way back to understanding why that's actually a triggerable and reachable bug. And that's the way we did it in practice as well. So here we don't know exactly where we are yet or how we get here. What you wanna do is if you look at the slide, you see that here we have a function where an input will be this use bits field, which is an integer, and it's checked with the function, but you can see that the check is rounded down to byte size. So if you can control the four bytes, it's a textbook trivial bypass, and then it flows into a straight stack buffer overflow. So that's pretty great, but is this reachable at all? Well, as it turns out, if we then go back a step and see which message we are in and what the definition of that is for the CSM or grammar, we find out that this type of cell selection messages, message fields, can contain uh, four different types of descriptors that are for the different uh, uh, radio access technologies, EU-TRAN, meaning LTE, U-TRAN, and then GSM. Well, the sad panda part is that, as it turns out, where the use bits comes from, the number of FDD cells is actually fixed. So no matter our bug pattern, we cannot use that directly to have a corrupt integer value. However, there are other fields, as you can see highlighted, that use the unbound repetition. And with that, in theory, you could use the one field inside the structure to corrupt the other field and end up with this good use bits that you want. But of course, it all, decide, uh, it all depends on what the final uh, structure outline uh, is of the actual unserialized output. And then when we looked at that, we find that inside the union for this particular message, the different descriptors, they are not treated as a union, but as a struct. So they are there sequentially one after the other. And also this means there's no which red was chosen flag. Instead, the handler code will select the first one which had a non-zero item count. And this is where all the stars align for us because there was a discrepancy between the priority of which one is checked first and the structure outline of which one comes first in memory. In fact, the EU trunk comes first, so you can corrupt all the other ones with that one with the repetitions, but the U trunk has the higher priority. So there's our attack. We use a corrupt too many repetitions EU, uh, EU trend description uh, to create a use bits field inside the U trend uh, with an items count that will trick the handler to think that we actually had U trend to begin with. So that sounds good, but just because we have repetitions that can reach that far, you're not sure that the overlap comes out correct. Remember with the bits, there's all these limits that you have to get lucky or you have to get correct. And here, uh, finally, um, was the step where, and once again, Laurent had to work quite a bit to figure out if we can get the right count and right types of repetitions. But the long story short is that um, it worked out and we were able to create uh, an encoding uh, which was accepted, decoded, and created as a result of fake U-Tran uh, unserialized version with the right uh, numbers uh, or the right uh, field values that created the stack buffer overflow. So great for us. And at that point, all right, you have a POC, which shows clearly you have stack control, you have a prefetch aboard with a control PC. Um, so we can all go home, but not quite. First of all, obviously exploitation would need a lot of other steps. Remember that our final goal is to actually break outside the baseband as well. But even before we get to that, the target that we worked on, our friendly target was a Kirin 970. It was Android 9 at the time. At that time, that was a fully up-to-date phone. So, okay, we know we have a zero day, but what about the newer devices? That was the thing that we wanted to uh, see if we can also target. And so, as we turn to the newer devices, well, this is where we basically ran into a brick wall. And uh, Laurent uh, will now take the second chapter to tell you how we managed to run through that brick wall. So after the initial success of finding bugs in the 970 basement firmware, we wanted to analyze the modem, of, uh, modem images of newer devices. But we failed way before the actual bug hunting. We found out that uh, Huawei started to encrypt uh, the modem images. Uh, they also discontinued uh, the bootloader unlock possibility in uh, 2018. So rooting the kernel uh, as a feature was out. 
uh, and it uh, uh, later turned out uh, old modem debug facilities have been also removed. Uh, the kernel is now also isolated from the modem. Uh, the direct reading of modem memory uh, from Android is not possible, and also crash logs uh, are restricted or gone. In short, we learned the hard way that our knowledge of Asian culture uh, was lacking in the fact that uh, Kirin uh, does not quite mean unicorn. At this point, we were stuck. Uh, this is where our research took an unexpected turn from pawning baseband uh, to pawning uh, Huawei's uh, secure boot. Uh, so based on older devices, uh, we try to enumerate uh, the firmware image chain uh, which finally loads the modem. The modem loading is initiated by the kernel uh, and actually loaded by the TOS, which eventually loaded by uh, fuzzboot and fuzzboot is started by xloader. To our great relief, up until uh, 990, uh, the Axloader image is still preserved in plain text. So finally we found something we could analyze. On the other hand, uh, we immediately realized that we didn't even know uh, what are the Axloader's responsibilities and its position in the boot chain. Uh, the boot process of uh, Huawei Kirin begins uh, with a, a power management controller. After that, uh, Huawei phones have a quite unique way of uh, boot up. Uh, the boot CPU is uh, not the application CPU like an uh, uh, ARM Cortex-A series, uh, but a much more simple one. In this case, it's a Cortex-M3 microcontroller. In the kernel sources, this core is uh, referred as uh, LPMCU, which probably stands for a low-power microcontroller. The bootrom and the following Axelder stage initialize the SLC to make it uh, prepare for the ACPU cores. The first image uh, to, to run on the ACPU in EL3 level is fastboot, which has several duties in the bring up process. It does without saying that every firmware uh, loading process is cryptographically verified um, based on a prepended uh, certificate chain of the images. We don't have time to uh, talk uh, um, to go into details about the header format and other details of the verification, uh, but our white paper contains a lot more details, so check that out. Um, by uh, Kirin 990, uh, Huawei reduced the privilege level of fast boot image from EL3 to EL1 uh, and uh, introduced a dedicated BL2 firmware to offload uh, the procedures that needs EL3 level uh, access. Still, regardless of the chip version, it is easy to see uh, and that uh, by hijacking the Axloader stage, one could gain complete control of uh, what code to run on the ACPU. Uh, next, uh, we had to investigate the attack surface of the Axloader. Fortunately, uh, soon we found out that there is an alternate boot pass in which we can uh, uh, have a chance to interact with the Axloader directly. Uh, this mode is the USB download mode, uh, which can be triggered with a corrupted uh, Axloader image, typically called a soft brick device, uh, or via test point. Test point is usually a tiny pad exposed on the back side of the PCB, uh, and the way to trigger it is to pull it to ground. Every Huawei phone uh, we've seen so far has this feature. Uh, we suspect this is because of um, factory flashing or for repairability reasons. Uh, we actually found about uh, uh, this uh, test point uh, only uh, for much older uh, Huawei device on some online forums. So uh, at first we weren't sure whether this will work on our target devices too. But luckily, uh, trial error uh, worked and we uh, didn't find it too difficult to find uh, the location of the test point uh, on uh, 980 uh, devices and, uh, and later on the newer 990 devices. Of course, this mode, uh, uh, the, um, the download images uh, are still verified uh, in the exact same manner, uh, just like uh, the ones uh, being read from a flash storage. Uh, so without vulnerability, you are still stuck. So at this point, uh, we fired up uh, Ghidra and look for bugs in the Axelera code. Uh, the plain text uh, image has a flat format, so it's not difficult to get it uh, to load correctly. Uh, first, we have to understand the protocol that is used. In USB download mode, the phone enumerates as a serial over a USB device. As it turns out, the communication over a serial line uses a slightly modified version of the ages-old X uh, modern file transfer protocol. Uh, 
to quickly summarize uh, the main building blocks of the um, uh, blocks are uh, four different types of chunks, uh, as it can see on the slides. Uh, well, that seems uh, quite uh, simple, right? Well, it turns out uh, still a lot could uh, go uh, wrong and it, and it uh, went wrong. Uh, luckily, we ended up finding a bunch of uh, exploitable uh, vulnerabilities in the Exceler code. Better still, uh, after successful su uh, exploitation, uh, we were able to dump uh, the bootroom uh, code. Uh, and uh, not only did we find that uh, some of the bugs also affects uh, the bootroom code, we also found several that were bootroom specific. Finally, although we started with 980, uh, we later uh, able to verify uh, that uh, most of these were also there and exploitable on 990. Uh, due to the different memory maps, uh, exploitation uh, in Axelder and uh, Bootroom was uh, different. Also from uh, these bugs led to uh, arbitrary write and others to sequential buffer overflows, so they needed uh, different steps. Long story short, uh, we managed to exploit uh, each of these full arbitrary code execution on LPMCU and ELHAR, uh, ER3 level on the uh, ACPU. Unfortunately, since we have limited time, uh, today we are only going to uh, discuss the first one in details. If you are interested uh, in the details of uh, all the other exploits, uh, um, please uh, check out uh, uh, our white paper. The first vulnerability uh, is uh, which we call the head reset bug uh, uh, was present in the bootroom um, bootroom code of uh, at least uh, the Kirin 980 and 990 chipsets. The Exponent protocol is stateful, uh, as it must know uh, the current download address when a when a when a data chunk arrives. There are many state variables, uh, but for for this bug, uh, the most important ones uh, are the uh, download address, uh, the size of the file and the next expected sequence counter. The first cause of this vulnerability is the fact that uh, address and size parameters uh, uh, were always updated before the validation. Uh, the second cause is that uh, there is no state uh, reset when a validation decides a head chunk uh, is uh, invalid. Uh, the third cause was that the state checking only uh, prevented data chunks uh, sent uh, without a valid head chunk, but uh, did not prevent it multiple head chunks. As a result, uh, we can get this very strong arbitrary write primitive in uh, three simple steps. First, uh, uh, first of all, send, send, send a uh, head chunk with a valid uh, values. Uh, this will set the next, uh, next sec uh, uh, state uh, to 1, allowing uh, data chunks uh, to be sent. Uh, while still allowing a head chunk to be stunned. Then uh, send a head chunk with a malicious address. The address uh, state uh, variable will be updated while the next sequence uh, uh, is left intact. Finally, proceed to a data chunks and override the arbitrary address with arbitrary data. Well, a pretty good uh, bootstrap exploit primitive, I'd say. Uh, Equip with uh, uh, ability uh, to uh, arbitrary uh, with an arbitrary write primitive. Our next goal was to turn it into code execution. The good news is uh, that uh, Bootram does not use any kind of uh, memory protection, so the whole Astrom region is readable, writable, executable. Uh, but of course, existing Bootram code uh, overwrite is not possible because of the the read-only nature of the memory. What we can do is to overwrite uh, the pushed return address on stack. Uh, and even though uh, we can patch code, uh, we don't even have to. Uh, the code we want to, uh, to be executed can be simply downloaded uh, in place of the X loader, because even if uh, cryptographic verification fails, the da data remains intact in memory. In practice, uh, we want to keep the communication channel alive to be able to interact with our uh, injected payload. And obviously, uh, we would uh, eventually I want to continue the boot process anyway. Uh, the most convenient way to achieve that is to start from the original uh, Exloader code and modify just a small portion of the Xmodem protocol by implementing uh, a custom message handler. Uh, moving on to newer devices, 
Accelerator battery method fails because uh, 990 Huawei uh, uh, because from 990 Huawei encrypted uh, the accelerator images as well. However, uh, we were happy to see that uh, previous headverse bug still worked uh, with uh, 990. Nonetheless, this left us in dark uh, as there is no uh, plain text bootroom or accelerator code to analyze or patch. So we wrote a full black box exploit. Based on the bootroom code of 980 series, we uh, created some heuristics to autonomously find the bootloader, uh, the, the X, X modem protocol handler, uh, which is the foundation of, of the communication channel. Downloading data from the host to the phone uh, is supported by the design of X modem protocol, but thanks to the Huawei uh, specific extension through the inquiry chunk, uh, four bytes of data can be uploaded to the host. This opened up a possibility to implement a very primitive interactive payload, which can be used to dump uh, the plain text excluder or bootroom code. Dumping was painfully slow. Uh, at uh, four bytes per second, it took about seven hours to dump uh, the whole uh, bootroom. There were some minor uh, disruptions uh, with uh, um, uh, the excluder decryption, as manually, manually invoking the decryption function caused a crash. The reason is still unknown. Otherwise, uh, we knew that uh, uh, Excluder uh, decryption works uh, because the phone does power on. So we simply left the original code pass uh, to de decrypt the Excluder image and then right before the execution would have handed over to the Excluder, we set a, a breakpoint and uh, hijacked the control flow. The breakpoint exception ends up uh, in, our, um, in our custom de debug handler uh, from where uh, we were able to uh, dump the plain text Excluder in about uh, 15 hours. So, uh, a little demo time. Uh, we, we start uh, from, uh, from, uh, from a, um, a powered off device. Here I power off uh, the phone uh, because uh, the test point can be only triggered at uh, boot time. Uh, now I press uh, the button uh, which triggers uh, the um, test point and then we can see that uh, the device is enumerated as a USB serial uh, uh, converter. Uh, first, we download the patched X loader. Of course, uh, it's patched, so uh, the verification falls, uh, which results in another enumeration. Then we execute uh, the uh, the the um, uh, vulnerability, the head reset bug, and it uh, and it helps to uh, to start the exploder. And finally, we uh, load the fastboot image uh, with a friendly little message, with, uh, which which um, uh, shows that uh, we clearly um, uh, clearly managed to modify the uh, fastboot code. Uh, so uh, now we have a full code execution in ER3. We can take that uh, into two directions. First, we can uh, read, write fuses and uh, UFS as Xloader. Uh, up to 970, we could directly dump the AS key and decrypt the firmware offline. From 980, the key can be uh, read out directly, but we can use the crypto engine as a decrypt oracle. Images aren't uh, coupled to a single device, so we can uh, decrypt uh, any image of any LTE uh, for a practical, a practical uh, current uh, chipset time. Second, uh, we can uh, continue, uh, the up, uh, continue up the chain, uh, always patching out the relevant checks uh, from images until we end up uh, with, for example, a rooted kernel. Uh, in practice, there were a number of gotchas involved in this. For example, due to size constraints, uh, um, in, in the white paper we provide the details. Uh, the bottom line is um, uh, that uh, we end up uh, with a seemingly successful uh, loading the uh, modified modem, and uh, and it and it just crashed, uh, like almost all the time. Not exactly all the time, uh, but uh, in, a, in, in, in a ways that made no sense to us. More in ways that started to make us question uh, everything we know about uh, ARM assembly. Uh, okay, now no what? It was the time to go back uh, to Balong, uh, rever reversing the, uh, to figure out uh, the modem OS changed, uh, how the modem OS changed uh, since uh, Kirin 970.
This part actually uh, took uh, a quite bit again. First of all, uh, we, uh, we ended up building ourselves a debugger to be able to dynamically test things. You can uh, again find additional details uh, on the implementation of our uh, debug, uh, debugger in the white paper. Uh, once we had this, uh, we were able to map out how, uh, how exploit hardening has changed. As you can see from the table, uh, Huawei uh, was, uh, ha has been uh, uh, busy improving the modem's uh, security, which is nice. Uh, I want to point out uh, the ASLR, in particular, uh, that was uh, introduced in 990. Because the Cortex-R8 uh, processor has no MMU, uh, this is uh, implemented as a pure physical address shift, uh, which provides uh, about um, 14 uh, bits of entropy. However, uh, the basement image is uh, still a flat image uh, that is not comp uh, compiled uh, to be position independent. So at first, we were dumbfounded at how ASR is possible if uh, the image is not uh, position independent at all. Eventually, uh, we figured out uh, that uh, Huawei has added a custom relocation table into the flat image. And the modem loading uh, process itself includes a relinking uh, stage that rewrites every, uh, every single hard-coded address value in the modem image uh, based on uh, the shift has been chosen. Now it's clear that the problem was uh, whatever uh, we patched code, the relocation sometimes uh, rewrote our uh, instructions. To solve this, uh, we first of all had to reverse engineer and then patch some uh, functionality in the trust zone that enabled the ASRR shift. Uh, and then we just modified uh, the relocation table itself in order to make sure that parts of the code uh, that we patched uh, uh, was not touched by relocations. With this, uh, at last, uh, had a fairly robust uh, debug environment uh, to consider further baseband exploitation. And so in the final chapter, we take a look at how you could use the type of primitives uh, for the remote that we talked about before and turn that into uh, a complete control of the platform. Here it's important to point out that the presentation has followed the same timeline as our research. So of course, by the time we got around all the bootloader stuff, the previously reported baseband bugs have of course been fixed to Huawei uh, uh, with over-the-air updates to their credit. So by this time, on a fresh device where we looked for sandbox escapes, of course, they wouldn't have it worked. Nonetheless, we wanted to see how you could complete a chain, assuming uh, a starting primitive. And here our mindset was, let's not try to create the longest possible chain, but the simplest solution. So we wanted to see if you could use an arbitrary write. Of course, you have now seen even a stack buffer overflow doesn't give you that on a Huawei baseband, but with a heap buffer overflow, it's possible, again, you can check in the white paper how you could transform a heap or flow into an arbitrary write. How you could use that and get a single step uh, towards uh, code execution at EL3. So at this point, you want to consider what the other service looks like if you're inside the baseband. And you could look for the most trivial approach is basically the messaging that goes between the baseband and Android and find typical parsing bugs there. Or you could think about the DMA-capable devices that the baseband is supposed to control and see if, if you program up uh, those for transactions, whether they are limited like they should. Or third option would be to look around at all the other cores outside the baseband and the application processor and see if we can create a lateral movement into a, pro uh, into a core that is maybe more powerful than the baseband in terms of the isolation. But the most interesting th thing would be if we could uh, hit right to the core of the SOC and figure out how the bus fabric actually controls DDR memory accesses and whether we can abuse that. So the first step in the case of Huawei means ICC, which is the intercommunication core. We really unfortunately don't have time to get into details of these bugs. I just want to point out that these were actually fined by uh, another researcher on the team. Uh, so credit goes to Jim for that. Um, beyond that, please check out the white paper for the details. And then came the second thing that I mentioned is the direct memory access. So here, uh, obviously, step one is get the data sheet, read everything, try it out, and maybe it works. Of course, we didn't have the data sheet. So the challenge in these cases is how do you figure out for a black box like a SOC, what device it's supposed to have, how you program it, how you control it. For us, it was a combination of 
dynamic testing and probing with our modem debugger and just trying things and looking around and scanning and looking at the Linux kernel source to find a jumping of points. And long story short, we were able to identify the address map and uh, control register uh, addresses for peripherals and figure out uh, some DMA engines, like the one that's supposed to be controlled by the modem to talk to the application processor, as well as another one that uh, the modem is tied to, to talk to the IOMCU and other core. And we also had to figure out how to control these. First, we of course tried, well, are these maybe standard ARM DMAs, like a DMA 330 or 230? But that was a fail because that didn't work at all on the on the control register areas that uh, they uh, they had. But then we got lucky by looking more around the Linux kernel. We found a DMA engine which is programmed by a Linux kernel driver. Of course, this is a limited DMA engine. It makes sense for the Linux kernel to be able to be master of it. It has nothing to do with the baseband. It has nothing to do with baseband sandbox escape, except that it works in the same way, functions in the same way as these other DMA engines. So from Linux kernel source code, we were able to figure out how to program these black box DMA engines. And basically here we turn into a Euro meme because we tried with the EDMA and it didn't work. And so then we got sad because it seemed to us, well, all our you know, great knowledge of DMA got us absolutely nowhere. But then we figured, well, let's try the other DMA engine because maybe they you know, didn't set that one right. And that worked. And then suddenly what we got was full uh, uh, memory control of secure world memory, trust zone and everything. So that's a nice CVE and, you know, finding a bug like this is good if you want to report it. But it's interesting that we have no idea about the discrepancy. So we wanted to figure out why things happen this way. And that's basically going to be uh, the last step of our, uh, of our journey. Uh, and that is something called DMSS which is essentially the memory firewall of uh, Kirin SOX. So how did we get here? Well, again, one thing that was a big hint for us is the kernel source. We looked around that and found some hints at certain addresses that seem to have got to do with programming the DDR. But uh, that wouldn't have been enough, but it gave us hints to where to look in trust zone code. So we did some reverse engineering and then we finally found the places where these things are actually being uh, uh, programmed. Uh, when I say these things, DMSS uses a concept of ASI entries, uh, which is basically similar to a PT in a page table. And basically what that means is that with one ASI entry, based on a master ID which identifies a core, uh, like uh, uh, one of the processors I mean, you can say this core for this physical address can access uh, this memory with, with these types of uh, access rights. And so from here, we knew that, well, Trust Zone can control these ASI entries, uh, but on a secure platform, nobody else could. Well, when we looked into that, what we realized is, well, there's a bit of a logic issue here because now we know the thing that protects things is the DMSS. And the DMSS is a DDR memory arbiter, meaning it protects accesses to DDR memory. The problem was that the control registers that we're talking about for controlling DMSS itself, well, those are not part of the DDR memory. And of course, what follows here is that, well, nothing prevents the baseband from accessing the ASI entries themselves. So you can directly reprogram them from memory, uh, from uh, the baseband. And from that point on, uh, increase your access to DDR memory however way you like. Except there was one more wrinkle, and this is the final bug I mentioned. For me, it's the pick of the bunch, to be honest because the baseband couldn't directly access these physical addresses that would be required to program the DMSS, but that was because of the baseband's own MPU. And here you could say, well, the baseband's own MPU doesn't matter if you have code execution, but remember, we were thinking about only using a single write primitive. You don't want to have to have the a priority requirement of getting around firmware versions, getting around ASLR. You just want to do a, a single write uh, repeatedly. And what we found is that Due to power management reasons, what the baseband does is it actually turns off the MPU whenever it goes into a sleep cycle. And it, when it turns it back on coming back on, there's a cache from where it gets the entries that it reprograms the MPU with. However, the problem with this cache was that it was writable, but it was only written at boot time. So there you go. If you have your write primitive, you use it, you rewrite the cache, you wait for the modem to go to sleep, which happens uh, quickly. It comes back, then you do writes again, for example, the DMSS and you're done. And so all that's left essentially is to show a demo. So let's uh, skip right to that. Uh, we have two, the first one shows that from the baseband, you can take over trust zone. You can see uh, on the video that 
first the one finger doesn't work with the fingerprint reader of course that's controlled by trust zone but after our exploit will run and that's simulated here as i said uh, on these this is uh, at that point a zero day but by the, that time the baseband bug is in so we use the bootloader stuff to uh, be able to inject the modem poc and the end result is of course now both fingers work and then finally no presentation would be complete without a Russia exploit, a remote root. So that's the last one that we show. So you can see again, we triggered the uh, POC and we end up with a root, with a root shell. Finally, I wanted to share some notes about how the disclosure went, uh, but we sadly are running out of time. So we'll do that in the Q&A. Thank you.